Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today we have Anton Matley. He was previously a guest on uh, episode GI18 and is back. Anton has held senior management positions at major New York, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Zurich financial institutions. During that time, he restructured uh, restructured, uh, commercial real estate worth over several billion dollars and oversaw loan portfolios consisting of aircraft, ocean vessels, and infrastructure assets. He has since been advising family offices, high net worth individuals, and private investment funds, facilitating their direct investments in commercial real estate across Europe and the United States. Today, Anton is the co-founder and CEO of Peak Financing, a boutique multifamily and commercial real estate financing firm focusing on finding the best financing for real estate investors. So thank you so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Charles. So it's great to have you on and talk about everything that uh, transpired over the last uh, two or three years since we've had you last on. And mainly, I want to talk about, um, can you give us just a little bit of background? Um, I know I gave you a little brief background yourself, but if you can give us a little background, uh, a little personally and professionally prior to getting and co-founding Peak Financing. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that's kind of important uh, f- uh, to f- to know that background. Uh, after I graduated, I uh, went to New York to work for uh, an investment bank there. It's today it's called UBS. Uh, worked there for five years, then in Tokyo and then in Hong Kong, where we sold uh, a division to a British bank, Standard Charter Bank. During all that time, and that was in the 90s when I started out in New York, uh, we still had all the uh, the tail end of all the savings and loan crisis that happened in the 80s. Uh, so the workouts for commercial real estate uh, back then, it took years, right? So we talk about five to seven years later when we still were uh, working on these workouts. And that's really how I started out. So in the current environment we are in today, obviously with peak financing, we are focused primarily as debt brokers, uh, commercial debt brokers on the origination side. But right now we help a lot of uh, uh, deal sponsors on the loan modification side for multifamily, for offices and for other uh, loans that that might be in trouble. And uh, so that's what we do. So can you give us a little overview of the current commercial real estate market? Because, I mean, over the last years since COVID and, um, I mean, what it looks like today with lending and, uh, as you said, that you're really focusing on workouts and loan modifications. Yeah, so we are not just focusing on that, but that's just the nature of the beast, right? When yeah. Particularly when we look at multifamily and offices uh, with all the bridge loans that have been taken out in 2021, 2022. Uh, it's not just for multifamily, it's also for other asset classes, including offices. And all of them uh, have some form of a, uh, of issues, right? Not everyone is in trouble, but on the multifamily side, uh, as you well know, and many of the listeners know, uh, interest rates, short-term rates were virtually at zero, even the 10-year treasury was at at record low rates. So you could borrow for a 10-year fixed as a larger deal sponsor and for a larger property at 3% fixed. Uh, and for bridge loans, you were able to get in somewhere around 3%, maybe 3.5%. And the problem is that bridge loans for true value add deals is not a problem. Uh, but when you do it even for stabilized properties, because you would only get 50% LTV on a Fannie or a Fannie or Freddie loan uh, and 80% or even more LTC loan to cost for a, for a bridge loan. So then everyone jumped on, on those. And that in, on its own still would not have been a big problem. The uh, problem, main problem was that the exit underwriting to stabilization as we, where we are today and where we actually should refinance today, most of these deals were underwritten to an exit 
interest rate for a permanent financing of around 4% plus minus, right? And uh, where are we today in for large loans? We are at five and a half plus. Uh, and so that obviously it's a big gap. At the same time, we have seen a lot of stress to, to get the NOI to where the projections were. So the projections were also very aggressive. So it's really a perfect storm there. Projections were very aggressive. Insurance rates increased. Property taxes moved up because the assessors realized, well, when values go up, we need to increase our assessment. And overall expenses moved up. And now today, with all the supply that comes online on the Class A space, it still trickles down to B and C, where the pressure now is on rents instead of double-digit rent growth we have seen in 2021. Now we have we see flat and in some places even negative rent growth. Yeah, no, that's a lot of great information. The when we're talking about. Um difference between bridge, we're talking about then fixed rates. Can you talk about the two underlying really indexes um, that these type of loan products are based off of? And if you could just uh, explain that a little bit to our audience. Yes, sure. For the maybe start at the permanent financing, because that's where typically most uh, borrowers uh, want to start out if they can. Uh, most are uh, the underlying uh, index is the 10 year treasury. Sometimes a lender may take the five year or seven year treasury, but overall, the 10 year treasury is really the core piece. And then there are for CMBS commercial backed securities loans, maybe then you have a swap rate, but it's still related to, to the 10 year treasury. So everyone is watching the 10 year uh, treasury very closely. And you typically have a so-called spread over the 10-year treasury. So for a Fannie or a Freddie loan, for example, for a larger deal, 10, uh, 7, 10 million and up, depending on affordability, you may get a, a spread of, of 150 to 200 basis points, so 1.5 to 2%, and that's your all-in rate. On the bridge loan and construction loans, in most instances today, before we had LIBOR, now we have SOFR, which is a overnight rate, uh, which can also be a, a, a monthly rate. It's typically the monthly uh, secured overnight financing rate that is being used. And there again, it's a spread that is being added to that. So back in 2021, uh, because the Fed rate was virtually at zero, guess what? The software was also virtually at zero, right? So it was 0 0.05 or 0 0.10, 0 0.1. So it a, was a very low uh, basis as an index. And even if you uh, added a 3% spread on top of it, then your borrowing cost was 3%. So today the sulfur uh, is uh, is a little bit above five percent, five point three. It fluctuates a little bit, but it's pretty stable. It's very closely mirroring really the Fed rate, and I had a spread which also have winded a little bit. They have come down a little bit, but let's say still three and a half percent to four percent. Obviously now you are in the eight to nine percent range, right? Instead of three. So we virtually talk about tripling your short term borrowing cost. Your fixed rate cost is not that uh, not that substantially uh, uh, from a uh, compared to the short end, but it's still essentially doubled. Right. So instead of three to three and a half, we are now at five and a half to six percent. For smaller loans, it's closer to the 7% range. So that's where, where we focus on and the market focuses on. And obviously, that's why everyone talks about the 10-year treasury and the Fed rate. The software and the 10-year uh, the treasury are really the key pieces to watch. One thing that I always thought was that there'd be like a correlation between, more of a correlation between the 10-year and also so far. But what we've seen over the last few months is 10 years come down, and the sofa really hasn't. I mean, why do you have any insight of why that might be? Yes, uh, so sofa really is is again very closely mirroring the Fed rate, which is the short end. So, uh, and that is driven by the Fed, right? The Fed rate is driven obviously by the Fed, and sofa closely mirrors that. So you will not see the sofa going uh, suddenly below the Fed rate. 
Now, uh, when it comes to the 10-year Treasury, at least in the United States, there is no so-called yield curve control. We have seen it in Japan and in Australia, where uh, their uh, side, the government is actually controlling the yield of uh, of the 10-year Treasury there in the United States. To a large extent, that has, is not taking place. Uh, what does that mean? The market is really uh, driving the, the changes in the 10-year Treasury. And the best example we have just now, over the last two weeks, uh, everyone was talking about uh, and two weeks ago with uh, Powell uh, being a little bit more dovish on his, on his statements uh, that uh, there will likely be cuts. We have inflation under control. The 10-year Treasury with the market uh, came down to around 3.8%. Now we are almost to 4.3% today, two weeks later. Why is that? Because that's where the market is listening constantly to signals, CPI, and other inflationary measures, uh, employment numbers, and obviously also what Powell and all his colleagues are saying, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of crazy that Powell makes a formal statement, then he goes on a 60-minute interview on a Sunday, and suddenly his tone is changing, and the market dissects that tone, and uh, the treasury yield immediately goes up, right? So, in other words, the market is really driving the the, the yield curve uh, from uh, to the from the uh, short to the to to the long end. Whereas, when it comes to the Fed rate and the related software, there is not really any any market uh, that that can can adjust it that way. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. So when I speak to, we were speaking about this briefly before we uh, hit record, and you know when I'm speaking to multifamily groups out there, and I imagine you're having these same conversations, and um, I was speaking to one last week in particular, and they were telling me that they were doing capital calls, um, and it's been kind of a recurring theme that I've heard from other groups is that they're they're working with their lender to modify their loan terms and create workouts. And when I speak to some lenders, they talk about it's the strength of the lender that makes that decision if they can do that. I mean, what do you see currently with multifamily borrowers? Are we going to see an influx of properties maybe coming on the market in the next 12 months uh, with a lot of these um, 2022 rate caps that are going to be come up? Because most people just got two years. They didn't really get three years from my experience because of the cost difference. So when, when this happens, um, I mean, where do you see that? Where do you see us coming out with that? And are you seeing a lot of lenders working with their borrowers? Yeah, uh, so to the last question, uh, some lenders are more flexible than others. Uh, and I would say so only if you're lucky enough that you have a, have a bridge loan with a bank, you're probably in the best position to have that discussion. Uh, banks generally have their uh, loans, keep them on the balance sheet. Sometimes they have participating banks, but generally speaking, banks are a little bit more flexible with those negotiations. Uh, when it comes to bridge lenders, some of them also keep uh, these loans on their own books. There, it's also easier to have those discussions. And those that have uh, so uh, have securitized those loans into so-called CLOs, uh, it's it's a little bit tougher uh, to to have these discussions. But it's only doable. But I would say what is happening virtually in all cases, there are always exceptions, right? So when you hear someone, well, I was able to have a loan modification without bringing cash to the table. These are exceptions. In most instances, there is a need for bringing cash to the table in one form or another. In some lucky cases, there might be still a significant amount of uh, of capex reserves and uh, interest reserves and maybe interest rate cap reserves where the lender and the servicer are willing to pull that money out rather than having a, a, a equity injection. But that is really uh, not the common uh, situation, uh, plainly because capex money is really needed to bring the property and the property's NOI up to where it needs to be. And uh, so everyone talks about, well, why can't we have to release the capex and uh, uh, and and all that? And it's it's really a problem. 
uh, to keep the property in the in a position that they actually can at least keep the current NOI where it is. Right, as soon as you don't spend money on at the property, it usually deteriorates, particularly C and P properties, very quickly. So I would say that is uh, is what we are seeing. Some lenders are willing to have negotiations rather than going into foreclosure to have pre-foreclosure negotiations uh, where they may talk to potential partners that may come in. You can call it rescue capital or uh, anything else. Rescue capital is really a misnomer in my view. Uh, it's, it's not really a rescue. It's just kicking the can down the road. But in most instances for the LPs, the money is likely not not coming back to them or or only a, a tiny fraction of the capital investment once you have rescue capital coming in because it's so expensive and you have to pay 15% for new capital that is in front of you so some lenders are certainly willing to do it but i would say the majority want to go through the proper process it's also a little bit of a liability issue right because if you are negotiate pre foreclosure and bring in a new partner let's say you sell it to a new partner uh, and you avoid foreclosure then the question is did you really do the best as a lender uh, and did you give the the property away, if you want to call it that way, to for too low of a value to a new buyer? So you potentially have to risk that LPs can sue the lender for for doing that. If you go through a proper foreclosure, there is no no discussion about this, right? Because then obviously you had to foreclose. You buy the property back as a lender and then you remarket it to whoever it is. So the process is definitely much cleaner with a foreclosure, uh, but some lenders have been willing to uh, to find solutions pre-foreclosure. I would say it's those that have more trouble loan on the books so they they need to move a little bit faster than the others. Do you have money sitting in the stock market and you're worried about it? Or worse, you have money sitting at the bank, not keeping up with inflation? My name is Charles Carrillo, founder and managing partner of Harborside Partners, and since 2006, I've been investing my money and my family's money into income-producing properties. These are real assets, real properties with real addresses that produce real cash flow. At Harborside Partners, we provide passive investors who love real estate with a turnkey investing solution. If you want to put your money to work in real estate but can't find deals, don't have the time to get funding, and the last thing that productive people want to do is manage real estate. We find the deals, we fund the deals, and we manage the tenants, the termites, and the properties. Partner with us at investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Go to investwithharborside.com. If you love real estate, you like the idea of passive income, and believe that income-producing properties will appreciate over time, go to investwithharborside.com. That's investwithharborside.com. Do you see with... Uh... Do you see that we're going to have, I know you spoke before and you, you had the numbers of how many properties are really up for, are really in this tight position. Do you see that there's going to be an influx of properties coming on the market probably, or do you think that it's going to be something where, um, I mean, like just from what you see, obviously you don't know about every property. Yeah, yeah. We, obviously we, we don't know, right? So overall, I would say that... Uh, you, we, we certainly have a, a, a situation in the bridge space, multifamily bridge space uh, specifically, where uh, we, it's hard to tell what the exact number is because we have a lot of on balance sheet loans. But my guesstimate is that we have somewhere between 60 to 80 billion of, of, of bridge loans that are outstanding among various uh, lender types. And of that, I would say at least half has some form of issues. I would say it's probably more than that. But I would say from based on the studies that we have done looking at it on the securitized side, because that's where we really can dig in. We don't know the balance sheets, the loans that sit on balance sheets because then we don't get the reporting. But based on what we see on the securitized loans, I would say at least a, th a third of all these loans that were taken out were very high leverage loans, very aggressive underwriting. And those, I would say, uh, need some form of a loan modification. Uh, in the best case, they may have a foreclosure. In the worst case, 
So we still talk about probably 20 to 30 billion and several hundred properties uh, across the US that are going to face this this year and next year. So with lending terms and requirements changing over these past few years, um, how has I mean, how has that changed after lenders seeing this going through? How has that changed where our requirements for underwriting on properties and borrowers getting tighter? And I mean, how is that also affecting the loan to value that lenders are willing to provide to uh, investors? Yes. So when it comes to Fannie and Freddie, they have always been uh, pretty conservative with their underwriting, right? So they only underwrite to in-place cash flows. So they don't do projections. And obviously that saves them from a lot of trouble, right? Uh, there are not that many distressed deals in the Fannie and uh, Freddie space, as well as n not many in the HUD space. Uh, thanks to that underwriting, usually those that are in trouble were relatively weak sponsors. And that's not what we see is only on the Fannie and Freddie side. They are tightening up their sponsor requirements to look for more uh, experience. They also look for financial uh, strength, including liquidity. So they are certainly much more focused on that. Uh, I would say, uh, looking at it, most most of the deals that are in trouble on the Fannie and Freddie side are those with weak sponsors, or then they had a major uh, event at the property, whether it was fire or a storm, and the sponsors were financially not in a position to to float the, the repairs before they got the insurance claims back. Right, so, uh, and when it comes to the bridge lenders. Uh, there are tons of bridge lenders out there. Uh, it's still a very aggressive market. So you can get bridge loans today uh, very easily as long as the, the deal makes sense. Uh, and however, they also look at a stronger sponsorship groups, more financial strength by the sponsorship group. And the LTC, they are definitely, generally speaking, they're always exceptions, but generally speaking, compared to where we were at 80% LTC plus breath on top. In most instances, it's now probably closer to the 70 mark, 70% 70 LTC mark, maybe 75. But so we certainly have come down five to 10% of the maximum leverage most bridge lenders are willing to do. Oh, that's a lot of great information. So what are some suggestions to real estate investors who may be looking for financing in this new lending environment? Are there some key questions that uh, uh, borrowers should be asking to brokers, to lenders, uh, while they're searching out the best solution for the properties? Yeah, so it's really un uh, important to understand the current landscape. Don't underwrite to, uh, uh, to where you thought the landscape was f f three months or six months ago. We constantly change as we have new lenders coming online, the aura is dropping off. So it's extremely important before you submit an LOI that you really understand what is likely available for your particular situation as a sponsor and for, for the property so that you are not uh, misjudging what you're actually able to get uh, with, with, with the financing. No, that's a lot of great information. So what are some common mistakes other than um, overestimating where the NOI is going to be, um, over leveraging a property? What are some other common mistakes maybe you've seen real estate investors make when uh, in regards to financing? Uh, bringing it back a little bit to what I mentioned before, all the lenders on are tightening up the sponsor requirements. Uh, do not overestimate your own capabilities as a borrower, right? Uh, more likely than not, if you if you have done just one deal and it was a smaller deal than what you are looking at now, uh, where you would like to get financing, you will have a very hard time. Uh, more important than ever is really your team. I would say lenders like teams that are full-time teams that are not doing it on the side. They also have a consistent team that the not sponsors that jump from partners to other partners to other partners. And uh, they also tend to prefer those that are better integrated operationally, including vertical integration, including uh, the property management side. Uh, 
because if you uh, obviously property management is not a money making machine for anyone but it only helps you to control your operations much better. You can give the property management more incentives when you also own the property management company. So I would say if you are a, a relatively small deal sponsor, I would consider partnering up with someone who actually brings significant strength uh, to the table so that you can do these deals. Uh, so that is what I would suggest on the sponsor side. And uh, then it's do not submit uh, offers without really having talked to, to a debt broker or to a lender beforehand that you really understand what this property can uh, can get in terms of, uh, of, of financing. Uh, it, it, unfortunately, it happens all the time where some sponsors, even larger ones, submit an offer and then realize that their financing assumptions were, were uh, completely off. Now, the third one is really uh, put in plenty of cushion when it comes to, to your underwriting. And we briefly talked about it. The 10-year treasury was at roughly 3.8%, just a little bit more than two weeks ago. Now we are close to 4.3%. That throws off everything uh, in your underwriting, right? So I would say add at least 50 basis points to your loan assumptions, the interest rate, and make sure that the deal still makes sense for you with that. And so then you have to cushion that even if interest rates, and f for whatever reason, jump up when you need to rate lock, at least you still are comfortable that the deal will pencil out for you. Yeah, thank you. That's a lot of great information. So Anton, how can our listeners learn more about you and uh, Peak Financing? Yeah, so we our website is peakfinancing.com. My email address is anton at peakfinancing.com. So it's A-N-T-O-N at peakfinancing.com. You also find me on uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and X. So it's pretty easy to connect with me and my team. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and uh, looking forward to connecting with you here in the near future. Yeah. Thanks again for having me on, Charles. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.